Perik Revi Halacha Aleph. Ein melam din divrei Torah. One does not teach words of Torah. Ela letal mid hagon only to an appropriate student. Noe b'maisof, whose actions are befitting, literally, who is attractive in his actions. The Rambam uses here two expressions: tal mid hagon noe b'maisof. So in the Shal Satruvis Yachel Yisrael, he explains Hogun is referring to his internal state. Internally, he is a, a fine human being, a, a moral human being, an upright, upstanding human being. Noah B'maisov is talking about his external behavior, which is a manifestation of his inner character. Such a student you teach Torah to. Oyle Tam. Tam, the Kesef Mishnah says, what does Tam mean? Tam means wholesome, Tam means innocent, Tam means simple. Tam means a student whose behavior is unknown. We're not sure. They translate it here in English. A person whose behavior is unknown. He's a Tam. But if the teacher knew that the student is following an inappropriate path, he's going in the wrong direction. So then, what do you do? What do you do? So the Rambam says, this is what you do. These words are very powerful. The first thing you have to do is help this child, help this student. Bring him back to the path of goodness. And help him start living according to a righteous, a good, a correct path. And then you examine him. You scrutinize what's going on. You scrutinize him. And then, and then you bring him into the base medrash and you teach him Torah. Amru Chachamim, our sages said, the Gemara in Chulun Kuflamet Gimel, Kol Ashoyne Letalmet Sheinei Hagun, Kilu Zorak Evan Lemarkulis. Somebody who teaches a Talmud, a student, who is living an inappropriate lifestyle, it's like casting a stone to Markulis. This teacher is considered as though he throws a stone to Markulis. Markulis is Mercury. Mercury was a Roman god. It was the Roman god of wayfarers, and the symbol of this Roman deity was three stones positioned in the form of a triangle. And how did you worship the Marculus? How did you worship Mercury? You worshipped it by throwing stones at that symbol. So the Chachamim are saying that somebody who teaches Torah to a student who is morally impoverished, and lives in an inappropriate, immoral fashion, it's like this teacher is throwing, casting a stone to Mercury, which is the way of worshipping it. And this metaphor is very precise. This is explained by the Prisha in Yeridea Simon Reish Mavav and the Lavush, and they explain, I may be throwing a stone to the Marculis, to the Mercury, because I'm trying to embarrass it. I'm trying to denigrate it. I'm like throwing rocks at it. You know when you throw rocks at somebody because you're trying to put them down. But essentially, unintentionally, I'm actually building up mercury. I am worshipping it, even though that's not my intention. The teacher may have very good intentions, but if the student, unfortunately, is rotten, so the very Torah that you're teaching him may be used by him in a manipulative fashion and may actually cause him to become much worse and to be able to influence other people badly. So I may have very good intentions because I'm trying to teach a student Torah, but if this student is really uh, inappropriate, he shouldn't be in the base medrash, and therefore it's like throwing a stone at Lamar Kulis. we have a Pasuk for this in Mishle Chavav, Kitzroid Evan B'margei Makein Noisen Liksil Kavit. As one who winds a stone in a sling, so is he who gives honor to a fool. What's the connection? So the Rambam says, Vein Kavit El True honor, there's no honor in the world other than Torah. Shanema the Pasuk says, in Mishlei, Peri Gimel, Kavod Chachamim Yinchalo. The wise shall inherit honor. Chachamim inherit Kavod. What honor do they inherit? The real honor, which is Torah. So this, the Pasuk is saying, that when somebody gives a Ksil Kavod, when somebody gives honor, Torah, to a fool, somebody who's not ready to receive it, so then it's Kitzroy Evan B'margeima. It's like one who winds a stone in a sling, representing the metaphor of the way they worshipped Mercury. And the Rambam continues, this is in terms of the student. Now let's speak about the teacher who behaves in an inappropriate fashion. Where did the Rambam get this? So there's a Gemara in Masechus Brachas Dav 
that speaks about a fascinating debate that existed in Jewish history. It still exists between Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel was the head of the Sanhedrin, and he had a, he had a, a, a philosophy, a policy. Kol Talmud Shein Toichi Kabar Leikonas Lebei Samedrish. A student whose inside is not like his outside, meaning he's not morally perfect on the inside and on the outside. Toichi is not Kabara, He shouldn't go into the base Medrash. If he's a faker, we don't take him in. And he had a guard by the door. The guard did not let anybody in. I guess you had to come with some uh, <laughs> certificate that they examined you and they said, ah, you're the real thing, and then they let you in. Rabbi Gamliel was dethroned. And the new leader of the Sanhedrin became Rabbi Loza ben Azariah. He was only 18 years old at the time. He was a very young man. But he became the new leader of the Sanhedrin. The whole story, Chavchas. And he immediately removed the guard from the door. And that day the base Medrash filled up with 400 students, 800 students, to the point that Rabbi Gamliel started to feel bad. He started to feel horrible because he felt that perhaps he prevented Torah from all of these students. So there was an argument here. And in parentheses, the Chidusha Harim asks a Gavaldika question. Why was Rabbi Gamliel upset? Didn't he know that if he removes the guard, there'll be another few hundred people? Like, what shocked him? I mean, this was your policy all your years. You really thought that the guard is just there in vain? The guard is there and nobody's coming in besides those who got a special permission to get in. So now Rabbi Lezben Azari removed the guard. Of course the place is packed. Like, Rabbi Gamliel, what happened? And the Chidusha Harim says, it's he says something very interesting. He says, Rabbi Gamliel realized that all those students who were sitting on the fence, all those students who never got permission to get in, he saw what the environment did for them. He saw that by allowing them into the base medrash, they became transformed. And this is what perturbed him so much that perhaps he made an error. Who is the Rambam paskening here? Like? Rebelazah ben Azayah. Because the Rambam says, Talmud hagun no abemaisav, and you can hear in his words, toichai baroi, hagun is toichai no abemaisav, is baroi, the instant answer, oile tam. What's tam? Tam is somebody you don't know. You don't know. You don't need a guard by the door and say, well, 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 we have to first examine you and scrutinize you and put you through the crucible and the test and then maybe we'll let you in. No, no. If you don't know, you let him in. If you know for sure that this is a student who unfortunately is going to use the tight in a wrong way, then you are not allowed to teach him until first thing is you have to try and help him do tshuva and bring him to the right path. And then if he's appropriate, bring him into the base medrash. And if not, the Rambam says, you should not teach him. I should add that... Uh, I mentioned in yesterday's shir, one of the extraordinary commentators on Rambam Hilchis Talmud Torah is Shulchan Aruch Harav Hilchis Talmud Torah. And over there he discusses this Rambam, and he says, this is a halach about the teacher, but the student should try to push himself in. Even if a student knows that he's not ready to change, but he wants to learn, go, go, push yourself in. He says, this is a halacha for the teacher, but the student should try to push himself in. And then the Shulchan Aruch Harav says, and maybe even the teacher should take him. Why? Because even though the Rambam says first, you have to make sure that he does tshuva, he says that's what you try. You try to do that. And what if it doesn't work? What if it completely doesn't work? So he says it's possible that even the teacher, there's a svara, he says it's possible. Shachanar Kharav, Hilchis Talmud He says, even if the teacher, even if the teacher should not put himself into a doubt, because he may not do tshuva. And if he doesn't do tshuva, so he's Zoya Kevala Markulis. So it's like you're throwing stones to Mercury. So he says, that's true. But the student should push himself in my absence. What is he going to lose? And if he's Zoya, he'll do tshuva. And then the Bashul Chanor Harav, this is Kuntris Achrin, Hilchis Talmatoyna Pedig Dalit. The Gamma Harav, Yesh Lemur, the Torah Lachas, that's where the base of Safik and Yavshabin Yanach. Maybe it's possible that halachically, even the Rav has to put himself in doubt. What's the doubt? The doubt is, if he does tshuva gevaldik, awesome. It's not Zerik Kevin Lamarkulis. It's helping a Jewish kid. But the suffolk is, he may not do tshuva. You're taking in a rotten potato who remains rotten. He says, if there's no other possibility, maybe halachically you have to. Elim, efshalach, zirit chila lamutavai, dezit shalach, nesulah beisamad, jishmat chimais et chila. So then why does the Rambam say, put him through this examination? So the Shulchan Aruch Rav says, if you know that you could bring him back to goodness by first not letting him into the base medrash. And that pushing him away, that rejection, is going to trigger within him a yearning, a thirst, and an eagerness to transform himself. Then, then indeed, you have to say you have to stay out. Until you do tshuva, then we take you in. But what if you know that rejection just keeps him out of the base medrash forever? So the Shulchan Aruch Harav says, maybe the halacha would be that then, if there's no other choice, even the Rav has to take him in. Allah Sufik! 
Maybe you're going to be throwing an Evan to Markulis if he doesn't do tshuva. He'll just use the Torah in a toxic way. Like the Gemara says in Yuma, I am Bez and Tainas Dav Zayin, that Torah can become some Amovis. It can be used in a poisonous way. But maybe the Torah will transform him. The Torah will, 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 the learning and being in this environment will completely transform him. What's his proof? He says it's a Beferish Gemara. Teda, Beferish and Shonor Harav. Which Gemara? Saita. Saita daf mem zayin omed alef. Many of the prints have deleted some of the lines over there. Yeshua ben Prachi had a student. His name was Yeshu. Yeshu once spoke about women. Yeshua ben Prachi threw him out of the base medrash. He came back a few times. Yeshua ben Prachi felt he's insincere. And he kept on pushing him away, pushing him away, pushing him away. One day he came during Krishna. Yeshua ben Prachi wanted he should come back. He understood it as ultimate rejection. And he went and he worshipped idolatry. Yeshu. Saita daf mem zayin. What does the Gemara learn from there? The Gemara says, don't do like Rosh says, what did Yeshua Mbrachi do wrong? He did the right thing. Here's a Talmud. Unless you are absolutely certain that he did Shuvah, don't let him into the base Madrish. Throw him out. The Gemara says there was something wrong. Why? Because if you're not sure that the rejection is going to bring him back, is going to help him do Shuvah, then bring him in. Allah Sofik, that you'll help him do Shuvah. And that's what he paskins la halacha and hilchas talmud Torah pay the gedalat halacha yuzayin. He says, don't teach Torah to a talmud who lives inappropriately. First, bring him to do tshuva, and then bring him into the base madrash. That's the Rambam. And then he says, but if you can't, and he wants to come learn, he wants to come learn, even though he didn't do tshuva, he just wants to come learn. So you should say, nah, this is evil. This is horrible. So the Balatanya Paskins, Tehe Smol Doicha, Vimin Mekarevis, not like Yeshua Ben Prachya Shadokha Liploini Bij Shte Ya Dayim. Wow. I should just say there's a Rambam and Hilchis Ritzeyach in the beginning of Perik Zion, that from the Rambam also, there's the Mashmos, this 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 part. So you could see it. This is also Shitas Rambam, where he speaks about Talmud Shagola, Maglin Rabbi Imai, a Talmud who killed somebody by mistake and he goes into exile. You bring the Rebbe into him from that Rambam. It's not for now we're gonna get there, Mitzvah Shem. I'll say it then, but from there you can prove from the Rambam, like this Taich in Shulchanar Kharav Hilchis Talmud Taira. Of course, I'm elaborating on this because everybody understands the powerful ramifications of this qualification in our own times. Let's go to the next piece. What about a teacher? He does not follow the right path. He's a good teacher. Maybe brilliant. Maybe a great communicator. But he doesn't live what he preaches. Even he's a great sage. And the whole nation needs him. There's no teacher like him. You do not learn from him until he does not revert his ways and come back to goodness. Shenemar the Pasik says, Malachi Perik Beis, the last prophet. The lips of the Kayan preserve knowledge. Toida you shall seek from his mouth because he is a Malach, an angel or a messenger of Hashem. Amru Chachamim, on this the sages said, Ma'it Katin Yudzayin, Im Doim Rav, La Malach Hashem Tzvah is Toida Yivakshu Mipiyu, Vim Lava Yivakshu Toida Mipiyu. If the Rav is comparable to a Malach Hashem Tzvah is to an angel, a messenger of Hashem, then seek to learn Toida from his mouth. But if not, do not seek to learn Toida from his mouth. This is the source the Rambam says, if a Rav is not a Malach Hashem Tzvah, even though he may have a lot of wisdom, do not be mevakish Torah me Now, what does this mean? A Rav is a Malach Hashem Tzvah. We're going to find, maybe once in a while, but we're going to find a teacher who's a Malach Hashem Tzvah, an angel. Yeah, so a lot has been written on this, but I'll tell you two fascinating interpretations. One comes from the Ponim Yafis, the Baal HaFlor, Pinchas Levi Yish Horowitz. A Rav Pinchas Levi Yish Horowitz, the author of Sefer Amakna, student of the Magad of Mizrich. The Rav of Frankfurt in Germany, the author of Makna, the Makna, the author of Aflon, Ksuvis, Makna, and Kedushin, the author of Panam Yafis on, on Chumash, one of the Ga'ine Hadar. And he says that a Malach is called in Tanakh, Oimeid. He stands in one place and a Shama moves this world. You can transform yourself. A Malach, the orbit, the spiritual orbit is more or less consistent and permanent and fixed. So he says, If the Rav is like a Malach in the sense, that he's not teaching in order to enhance his own knowledge and express himself. 
He's happy to be an oimid. Very often, a teacher needs to teach new material, innovative material, because he's bored of the material and he wants to express himself, but it's not what the student needs to hear. The student needs to hear the material that works for the student. If you're ready to be a malach, you're ready to stay in one place, even though it's not about your growth. But that's what the student needs. That's the teacher you're going to receive from. The Baal Shem Tov says, this is quoted in Degel Machene Ephraim in Parshish Yisroi. The Baal Shem Tov says a wonderful interpretation. He says, a malach is called an oimid. More or less, he's in one orbit. A malach doesn't experience big nefilis, big downfalls. Yes, everything in the world changes. There's always growth. Remember, goodness is infinite, always growth. But more or less, even when a malach goes to a lower level, it's still pretty much stable. So the Baal Tov says a fascinating idea, quoted by his grandson, the Degel Machin Ephraim. He says, every, I'm, I'm using my own words, every person has a bad day. I don't know, every person. Most people have bad days. Teachers also have bad days, you know. <laughs> Right, there's a teacher before Cholent and after Cholent, before the nap and after the nap, before the coffee and after the coffee. Coffee, the day his wife it was nice to him, the day his wife, you know, told him what she thinks about him. People have bad days. If it's possible that when I have a bad day, my messages get distorted, you can't learn from me. So, my Rav, even when the Rav has an afila, even when he has moments of katnos, even when he has difficult moments, but he still retains a pristine purity not to lose the plot and not to distort the message he teaches, then you could receive Torah from his mouth. Of course, on a most basic level, it means that the Rav must be of sterling, pure character and behavior to receive Torah. And of course, here's, there's a big question, Gemara Meseches Chagiga, Reb Meir is one of the greatest sages, and who's his Rebbe? His Rebbe is Elisha ben Avuya. Elisha ben Avuya is actually a heretic. Elisha ben Avuya leaves the Jewish faith. He's brilliant, he's a Chacham Gadol. But Reb Meir learns from this, the Gemara asks, the Gemara asks the question, the Gemara answers, Reb Meir was different, he was a great student, he was a Talmud Gadol, somebody who's a great student can do it. Everybody says, why doesn't the Rambam put this in? Why doesn't the Rambam put in the Talmud Gadol? And those who say, well, it's uncommon, and it's very weird, the Lachem Mishnah says, the Rambam put in all halachas, I don't care how uncommon it is. <laughs> the Divrei Yoyal writes, as Sat Mirav says, because today nobody can be such a student and learn from such a teacher, and when Mashiach comes, there won't be such teachers, so therefore the Rambam, the Rambam didn't put it in. But it's a fascinating thing that Reb Meir, the Gemara says, He knew how to take a pomegranate and take out the seeds and all of you know the yellow parts, the shells and the husks that are bitter, Reb Meir knew how to discard. The Maharal in Nesivois Oilom Nesiv HaToyre says something very powerful and that is what the Gemara means about Reb Meir is means that Reb Meir in every halacha he saw the Pnimiyas HaToyre. He saw the godliness of it. And therefore, Elisha ben Avuya's personality and mindset couldn't affect it. He says, most of us, when we learn Torah from a teacher, he said, the human frailties of the teacher will affect the Torah. And the Torah itself can become distorted through his mouth. And therefore, I'm receiving a Torah that could be toxic, at least partially. He says, Reb Meir, Reb Meir in the halacha, he, can, he, he grasped the pure godliness of it, the pure spiritual, internal, divine message of the halacha, which can't be distorted by Elisha ben Avuya. Toichoy Ochal is a pshat in Torah. He learned Toichoy is a Torah. The Medrash says in Reb Meir Sefer Torah, it said, Kosnes Ur with an Aleph, not with an Ayin. Ur with an Ayin is hide. Ur with an Aleph is light. How could Reb Meir change his Sefer Torah? The pshat, of course, is, the Maggit says, in the Ur he saw Ur. In the skin, in the shell, he saw the light. And therefore, Reb Meir couldn't be distorted. Halacha Beis, says the Rambam, Ketzad Melamdin. How do you teach? What's the format? Harav Yoshev Bereish Vatalmidim Lefon of Makafan Atara. The Rav sits at the head, and the students sit in front of him, surrounding him like a crown, basically like a circle, perhaps like a half circle. So that everybody should be able to see the Rebbe and to be able to hear his words. It's critical when you're learning to be able to see the teacher and hear the teacher. So therefore they would sit in front of the Rav like a semicircle, a half circle. That's what we call it, like a crown. It was basically, he was a crown surrounding the Rav. But not surrounding him in a full circle because then some of them won't be able to see him. Fascinating. 
There can be a situation where the teacher sits on a, on a, on a seat, on a throne, or on a chair, and the students sit on the ground. Or everybody sits on the ground, the teacher and the students, or everybody sits in t- and, and on chairs, the teacher and the student. And where do we learn this from? Gemara Megillah Chaf Aleph, a fascinating source. Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu Parshas Veschanan Va'ata Poi Amoid Imodi Va'adabra Lechaz Kala Mitzvah Vachukum Vameshpotem Moshe says Hashem told me after Matan Torah You come and stand together with me and I'll teach you the whole Torah Hashem is the Rebbe Moshe is the student and Hashem says Amoid Imodi You stand together with me What's the point? Obviously you'll be together with Hashem He says come to me Stand with me From here we learn That a Rebbe and a student Have to be on the same level Either they're all on the ground Or they're all sitting on chairs So if he's sitting on the chair They should also be sitting on the chair If he's sitting on the ground Then they can also sit on the ground And the Rambam says A fascinating piece of Jewish history Which is I guess part of halacha In the earlier parts of Jewish history The system was that the Rebbe would sit and the students would stand. Now, parentheses, I, we just said that it's disrespectful. So the Lechem Mishn explains, no. It's disrespectful if he's sitting on a chair and they're sitting on the ground. Either they're all on the ground, they're all on the chair. But the fact that they're standing when they're learning is not disrespectful. And the fact that he's sitting is because he's teaching. He needs to concentrate, he needs to be relaxed, he needs to be serene. It's much easier for the Rebbe to sit and they're standing. That's not a problem. That would be a normal fashion. If they're both sitting and they're on the ground and he's on the chair, that would be inappropriate. This is like a Mishnah says. So in the beginning, they would all stand while he would sit. Then it changed. The Rambam says, before, the era before the destruction of the second base, it all changed. The minig, the custom everywhere was that the Rebbe should teach the students and they're also sitting. Not only he's sitting, but they're also sitting. What does he mean with Mekoidim Chorban Bayez Shani? The source of this is a Gemara Meseches Megillah, that Rem Gamliel, Rem Gamliel's days, everybody started to sit, also the students. And the reason was because of weakness. It was too hard for the students to stand for hours and hours and hours and concentrate and listen. They all had to sit. In fact, the Mishnah says at the end of Meseches Saita, Mishemais Rem Gamliel Azakim Batal Kvoid HaTayra. Where Rabbi Gamliel died, the glory of Torah was nullified. What does it mean the glory of Torah was nullified? What happened? So the Rambam explains in Pirush HaMashnayis that they started to sit. Why doesn't the Rambam say where Rabbi Gamliel died? Why doesn't the Rambam Gamliel, they say the days of Gamliel says before Chorban Bayez Shaini? So the Vaidus HaMelech explains because there's two gerses, which Rabbi Gamliel? There were two major Rabbi Gamliels. There was Rabbi Gamliel Hazoke, Rabbi Gamliel the Yavna. You had Hillel the Elder. Hillel had a son, Shimon. He had a son, Rabbi Gamliel, if you remember the introduction of the Rambam. He's called Rabbi Gamliel Hazoke. He lived a few decades before the destruction of the second base HaMikdash. He had a son, Shimon, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. He was killed by the Romans. He's one of the Asura Gemalos. Then he had a son, Rabbi Gamliel. He's known as Rabbi Gamliel the Yavna. He was the head of the Sanhedrin in Yavna. He's the one who had the policy that you don't let everybody into the base Medrash. I spoke about. That's not Rabbi Gamliel. It's Rabbi Gamliel the Yavna. He lived after the Churban Beis HaMikdash. His father was murdered by the Romans. His Zayd was Rabbi Gamliel Hazakin. The Rambam obviously holds that this is a story about Rabbi Gamliel Hazaken, not Rabbi Gamliel the Yavna. So the Rambam says this happened before Chorban by Sheni, before the destruction of the Second Beis Hamikdash. Everything changed. The bodies became weaker. They simply could not stand anymore. And in that sense, bottle covered Hatayda. Even though they sat days and nights and learned. But the fact that they weren't standing, they were sitting is bottle, but bitl kvay datayna. It could be also the Rambam says, mikaydim churban bayashene, because he wants to explain what happened. That as it was the fading years, as the decline was happening towards the destruction of the bayashene, this gives an explanation why it happened, that before churban bayashene, things changed, and the students had to sit. And I think there's also a very deep halacha, and the day halacha is, you're looking for success. You're looking for effectiveness. In other words, if I am stubborn and I say, no, everybody has to stand. Everybody has to stand. But they're not going to be able to learn. But this is how they used to do it. You have to know when to alter things that will not alter the substance. They may just alter the packaging so that the ultimate message will be able to be communicated and your work will be effective. I think this is a very profound lesson in halacha. Of course, you always have to be careful what you're changing. Over here, they were changing something ultimately which is aesthetical, even though we do say, bottle covered hatayra, where Rim Gamliel Hazakin passed away. Halacha Gimel. 
If the teacher was teaching from his mouth to students directly, Malamid. Let it be so. Speak directly to them. But if he was teaching through an interpreter, through somebody who's a spokesman, in the days of the Gemara, they used to have often a metargem. A metargem was somebody who translated. Sometimes the Rav spoke in one language, let's say Lashon Kodesh, but the students didn't have such a good uh, mastery of that language. So there was somebody who would translate the words of the Rebbe, or he would explain the words of the Rebbe, some basic explanation, or conversely, if the Rebbe spoke low and the people would not be able to hear, and the Metargem had a a loud, booming voice, he served like an amplifier in days of old. Now here's an interesting thing immediately, the Ramah points out in Shulchan Aruch, the that in Shulchan Aruch we don't have the halachas of a meturgam, and why? Because the Shulchan Aruch only wrote about halachas that were applicable in his day. Rabbi Yosef Karo, li, Karo lived in the 1500s, he's also the author of Kesef Mishnah on the Rambam, whose main mission was to show the sources of the Rambam in Gemara or Medrash. So Rabbi Yosef Karo and Shulchan Aruch wouldn't put in these halachas, but the Rambam follows his principle, and that is he wants to include all of Torah, all of the halachas. So he puts in the halachas of the Meturgaman. So the Rambam says, if he's teaching through a spokesman, then then the translator, the interpreter, stands between the Rebbe and the students. The Rabbi, the teacher, says it to his spokesman, and he gives it over to all the students, Ukshain Shailan Lamatargam. And then when the students ask a question from the interpreter, who Shail Rav, he brings the question to the teacher, Varav Meshul Lamatargam, Lamatargam Meshul Shail. The Rav doesn't skip over him. He speaks, he answers to the interpreter and he gives it over to the question, the one who asked the question. The Rav should never raise his voice louder than the voice of the Metargem. In other words, this is respect to the one who you chose to give over, to be your spokesman, to translate, to interpret. He shouldn't raise his voice louder than him. Often he couldn't because the whole point why they had a metargem was in order for the voice to travel because the Rav's voice was too hushed, it was too low. But sometimes, as I said, there were other purposes. He can translate into another language. He could give some basic explanation. When the metargem is speaking to the Rav, when he's asking a question, say, from the student, he shouldn't raise his voice louder than the voice voice of the Rebbe it should be the same voice because they are communicating to each other. The spokesman who's giving over the words to the students does not have permission not to diminish, not to detract from the words of the teacher or to add or to alter. You know, he may have some of his own ideas, right? You know what translators can do. I have to tell you, some years ago I was asked to translate the uh, a particular speech that was being given in Yiddish, and I was asked to translate it into English, and I was sitting in an office, and I had headphones, and I was speaking into a uh, mic, which was going to people's headset, to people's, uh, they had earphones, headsets, and they were listening. And the person said something, and I understood what he said, but I knew that if I translate that, nobody will understand a word he is saying, he's too abstract. So, I don't know if I went into the, the classical definition of Rava Maturgaman because I was hired for that reason, but I actually, uh, I gave over, I presented something a little different than I mean, he was in the spirit. And in the middle, in order to explain the idea, I said a joke. So suddenly, everybody who was listening to the English translation burst out laughing, and everybody else in the audience who was listening to the original didn't know why they did not get the joke. But the classic Maturgaman, don't take away from his words, don't add, and don't alter, don't change. Elim ken hoya Turgaman aviv shalchacham rabbi. There's one exception. If the translator of the interpreter is the father of the sage or the rebbe of the sage, then he can add, he can attract, he can alter. What if the teacher tells the interpreter, so my teacher told me, or so... My father, my master told me, but he didn't mention the name. He said, my father, my teacher. Now, if the interpreter says over, so my father said, it's going to create confusion. When the translator says over the words to the people, 
He says it in the name of the sage. If the Rebbe said, my father said, or my Rebbe said, let him say the name of the father of the Rebbe. He explicitly mentions the name of the father of the teacher, or of the teacher of the teacher. He says, Kach Amar So said Rabbi so-and-so. Rabban Aplaini, Rabbi so-and-so. Ah, you said, don't add or alter the words of the teacher, and the teacher didn't mention the name. That is for a simple reason. It's forbidden for the teacher to call his Rebbe or his father by the name. That's why he didn't mention the name. He says, my father. He doesn't say the name of his father. My Rebbe he doesn't say the name of the Rebbe. But the Metargim, who's not a child or a student, when he communicates it to the students, it's appropriate for it to be clear and concise, and everybody should understand the source of the material, and therefore he should mention the the name. Here's another very interesting example. The Ravid argues here with the Rambam and he says, the Rambam says, if the Turgaman is a father or a teacher, he could change. The Rambam says, this is a Dover Chad, the Ravid, this is a Dover Chadash, when are you going to have this? It's a rare situation. Your father is going to be your translator, your Reb is going to be your translator. And the Kesef Mishnah right away puts there, he says, let's say it does never happens. It's very rare. For the Rambam doesn't must make a difference. If it happens once in a year, it happens once in a hundred years. There's a halacha about it. He's allowed to change the word. He's allowed to add the words. He's allowed to detract. So the Rambam has to write it. Then the Kesef Mishnah says the Rambam actually took it from a Yerushalmi. Dalit. Harav Shalimid. Halacha Dalit. Harav Shalimid v'lo yevinu ha-talmidin. A teacher taught, and the students didn't understand. Lo yichais aleim. The Rebbe should never get angry at them. V'yirgas and get upset. Elechayz of a shayna dover afilu kama pamach yevino emekaloch. Let him repeat it and review it and explain it even many times until they understand the depth of what he's saying, the depth of the halach. Now conversely, the teacher should never get upset and angry that they don't understand. With patience, he must repeat it and repeat it and explain it till they get it. But conversely, a student should never say, Hey Vanti, I got it, I understood. He did not understand the material. But he doesn't want to get the teacher upset. He doesn't want to make the teacher feel that he's a failure. He doesn't want to embarrass himself that he's incompetent. Do not do that. He should ask and repeat his question and ask the teacher to explain himself even numerous times. I, he already asked three, four times and the teacher explained three, four times and he didn't understand. Ask again. What happens if the teacher loses it? You know, <laughs> teacher explained it eight times. And the student still doesn't understand, and the student is being honest, and the teacher gets angry. He loses and he gets upset. The student shouldn't back off, and the student shouldn't lie and say, I understood. You know what the student should do? He should say, Rebbe, my teacher, This is Torah. I have to learn. And my mind is not so broad. These are my faculties. Those are the words he says. Tairahi, this is Tairah. And of course, those words Tairahi means, you don't expect me to go out of the Bismedish. You don't expect me to give up. And you also know that you don't own it, just like I don't own it. Keset Tairah is for everybody. It's yours, but it's also mine. Tairahi, and I have to learn. And you're my teacher. And Hashem gave you the mission to teach me, like we learned in Perik Aleph. Every Chacham has a commandment to teach every student who wants to come learn. Vishinantam Levanacha. Of course, as long as the student is behaving nicely, like we learned in Allah Aleph. So I have to learn, and it's Torah. And Daitik Tzara, you see, he says three things. First of all, it's Torah. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to all of us. I have to learn. And Daitik Tzara, and it's hard for me to learn, so I need you to explain it. It's a beautiful story in Gemara Masechta Erevin, Dafnon Dalet. There was a teacher named Rev Preda. He had a student, and the student would not understand the material if the teacher did not explain it 400 times. And this is what Rev Preda would do. And the Gemara says that once he was in the middle of teaching the student, and a delegation came into him, and they needed his help for a mitzvah, and Rev Preda said, that he's soon going to finish, and then he's going to go and help them. 
he was planning on finishing the 400 times and the student will understand and then he'll go. After 400 times, the student didn't understand. He says, what happened today? I explained it 400 times. The student said, I was anxious because I thought any moment you're going to be leaving. Since he heard the teacher tell them, I'm going to see you in a few minutes. So he already couldn't hear it. He couldn't absorb it. It's an incredible lesson. Right? Even though the teacher was there and he was fully attentive, but the student felt that any minute he could leave now, so he couldn't be fully present. And Repraid explained it another 400 times, and he got it. And ultimately, the Gemara says, he got an offer that you can't refuse, either to live for 400 years, or that he and his whole generation will get Elam Haba. He chose the latter, and Hashem said, give him both. But this is the uniqueness of that ultimate teacher. This is this, one of the sources of the Rambam, how you have to behave towards your student. Hey, fascinating Allah. This is so relevant. A student should never be ashamed from his friends who mastered the material the first time or the second time. And him, it took so many times to get. You want to naturally want to feel shame. And therefore, the next time around, after the second time, you say, oh, oh, I understand, I understand, because you don't want to be the one that they're going to be thinking about or pointing fingers, you know. He's the one who's slowing down the class. Do not be ashamed from your friends. You know why? Why not? Shame is bayish Because if you are ashamed in this area, you're going to be coming every day to the base medrash and leaving the base medrash without learning anything because of your sense of inner insecurity and shame. Therefore, the early sages taught, told us, the one who is ashamed will not learn. A bashful person will not learn. Nor should the short-tempered teach. Captain is somebody who has a short temper. If you're a teacher, and when somebody doesn't understand once, twice, three times, you go into plots and get angry and scream at him and quit and denigrate him, you cannot be a malamid, you cannot be a teacher. So we have two conditions. The one who's learning, the student, must not be bashful. He has to be able to be honest with what he gets and what he does not get. And the teacher must be, have patience. When is this said? When the students did not understand the material for two reasons, either because it was very deep, it was partially deep, or because the student may have weaker intellectual and cognitive faculties. In other words, he's trying, he just can't. Then the teacher must have all the patience in the world, like we said with the 400 times. What if the teacher sees that they're being lax, they're being lazy, they're just not being attentive? In other words, they're not putting in the effort. He's teaching, but they're not putting in the effort. It's not that the material is so deep or that they're struggling, but simply they're not, they're not, they're not applying themselves. That's why they didn't understand. Then, then, he should display an, a certain upsetness or disappointment with them. Or He should challenge them with words in order to trigger them, in order to sharpen them. About this, the sages said in Meseches Ksuvah's Dav Kuv Gimel, this was the famous, one of the last final will and testament of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi to his son Rabbi Gamliel, who was... A grand, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was a grandson of Rabbi Gamliel de Yavnu, was a grandson of Rabbi Gamliel Azakun, who was a grandson of Hillel. We mentioned earlier, so it's all connected. And he told his son, Zroik Mare Betalmidim. Zroik Mare Betalmidim means throw, cast fear into the students. The students have to feel that this is a great moment in history and they should not be lax. It's inappropriate that a teacher should behave in a light-headed uh, very frivolous and uninhibited way in front of the students. He shouldn't, uh, he shouldn't be overly frivolous with them, you know, laugh with them and uh, break down all the boundaries. He shouldn't eat and drink with them so that his reverence will be on them for one purpose. They should be able to learn with him and from him diligently. Their, rav, their teacher must be very connected to the students. 
but you want a certain sense of awe and reverence and respect so that they should really feel the greatness of the moment and be able to be attentive and absorb the material. Halachavov. <laughs> you don't ask questions to the Rebbe right when he walks into the base Medrash until he relaxes. He regains his, gains his composure. He's settled. Nor should the student ask a question right when he comes into the base Medrash until he sits down and relaxes. You want that the teacher should be able to respond to the question with full presence. Don't attack him with questions the moment he walked in. But the student also, don't walk in and right away start asking questions. You sit down, relax, so that you can articulate your question and think before you speak. Two students should not ask questions simultaneously. It's going to be confusing for the teacher. Don't ask the Rebbe about a different topic that he's not teaching. The opening of Masech the Shabbos. What happened? Rav asked Rebbe a question. And what did Rebbe Chia tell him? When Rebbe is teaching this Masech, don't ask him in another Masech. Ask about the topic that they're dealing with. Don't start asking questions off topic. <laughs> Some people have this innate tendency. They have to ask questions off topic. It's almost like, I don't know if it's part of the DNA, but they have to go off topic. Don't do that. So that the teacher shouldn't be ashamed. He has not prepared that material. The teacher has permission to... Uh, to deceive the students through quizzes, in other words, through questions and things he does in front of them, which are actually wrong. These are, you know, catchy questions because he wants to sharpen their mind. And also to test their memory, if they remember what he taught them or not. And certainly he has permission to ask them about a different topic than the one they're dealing with in order to inspire them and arouse within them the willingness to review and remember and master the material. You do not ask questions from the teacher when you're standing. He probably means, many of us say, he means both. In other words, the teacher shouldn't be standing, and some say even the student shouldn't be standing. There's an argument in Mepharshim, what does the Rambam mean? Does the Rambam mean that the student shouldn't be standing and the teacher shouldn't be standing? Or it means that the teacher shouldn't be standing. And you don't answer standing because the teacher, when he answers, should be sitting because the answer will come out in a more relaxed fashion. It's easier to communicate when you're sitting in a calm way. You don't ask a question from a high elevated high place, meaning the teacher is in a low place and the student is in an elevated place, or conversely, and not from a far distance. You know, you scream out your question. That's not how you do it. And don't ask a question from behind the teachers, from behind the elders. You, you face him. You don't need him to turn around, which is disrespectful. And you only ask him a question in the topic that we're dealing with. The Kesef Mishnah says, he said that in Allah Chavav, you should only ask about the topic. So the Kesef Mishnah explains that earlier he was talking about, he's learning Hilcha Shabbos, and you start asking him a question in Tuma or Tara, or Ribis, or Kachim, a completely different, different Masechta, different Indian. Here he's saying something else, and that is, ancient of Ella Be'inyan, even, even in the topic that you're learning, Ask about what he's talking about, not about another thing that is connected to the topic, but it's not part of the not part of the discussion. This is how the Kesef Mishnah explains it. You ask with awe, with respect. Don't throw out more than three questions. It's too difficult. You ask one, two, three. Don't ask, you know, eight questions. You can ask later. In one topic, you throw out three questions simultaneously is enough. Two people ask the Rebbe a question, even if not simultaneously, but one after the other. He can't right now answer every question. He can answer one. Or he can answer both. But the question is, 
what gets, which one does he give uh, preference to? So the Rambam says this. If one asked on topic and one asked off topic, so he answers first the one on topic. If one asked a question that's practical, and one asked a question which is abstract, you first address the practical question. One asked a question about a halacha, a verdict in halacha, and one asked a question about a medrash. Medrash means the svarim that explain the psukim of Torah. And there could be halachas from that. But it's not a clear halacha, it's more an explanation of the psukim, like the svarim sifra, sifri, niskakim la You first address the one who asked about a clear, concise, established halacha. Medrash v'hagad. One asked medrash, one asked hagad. Medrash would be the medrashim that explain the psukim. Hagad are homiletical ideas. Different teachings of the sages, different stories, different narratives, which are part of Torah, like Medrash Rabbah, Tanchuma, is Kokkala Medrash. You first address the Medrash question. Hagada Vakalva Khaimer. One asked a question in Agada. Again, these are the homiletic parts of Torah. And one asked a question of Kalva Chaimer. Kalva Chaimer is the first of the 13 methods that Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Jewish people of how to interpret the text of Torah known as Kalva Chaimer. Niskakin le Kalva Chaimer. You first address the one who asked about a Kalva Chaimer. He wants to understand the Kalva Chaimer. Kal means light. Chaimer means heavy. And it's basically the logic if I tell you that somebody can pick up uh, weights of 200 pounds, certainly he could pick up 50 pounds, right? Lahavdal, that's the logic of Kal V'chaimer. If he could pick up something heavy, if he's a heavy weight, certainly he could pick up something light, Kal. Kal V'chaimer, Gzeir Shava. What if somebody's asking about the logic of Kal V'chaimer or Gzeir Shava? Gzeir Shava is the second method of interpreting Torah. When you have two words that are used in different psukim or different halachas, we believe in the theory of copy-paste, which means the fact that the Rebbeinu Shalom used the same word here and an identical word in a completely different mitzvah. It's a form of copy-paste, which means the laws of the first scenario will be applicable to some degree in the second scenario. Niskok in the Kalvachimer. You first address the question about Kalvachimer, not a Gzairah Shavu. The pre says, because Kalvachimer is pure logic. Gzairah Shavu is something people usually received from their Rebbe, and therefore we're afraid that the Kalvachimer is easier to forget. What if the two people asking questions, one is a sage and one is a student? One is a sage who already was ordained, and one is a student who's learning. You first address the sage out of respect. Talmud v'amaris, neskakan Talmud. One is a student and one is an amaris. Amaris is somebody who doesn't really learn. He's not very knowledgeable. He's very ignorant, but he came to ask a question. First you address the student. What if both are sages or both are students or both are ignorant? They're not involved in learning. Or So he says, what happens? So he says like this. So, if both people who are more or less equal in status asked about two halachas, or they asked two questions on the words of the Rebbe, or they're giving two, two different alternative answers to explain the Rebbe's words or answer his question, or or they both asked about practical things. In other words, if one asked about a practical thing or an abstract thing, so we already know which one gets preference. But if both are the same status and they're asking two questions and there's no reason to give one preference to the other, so the Turgaman, the one who's the spokesman, he is the one who is responsible to present the questions and to communicate the answers, he can choose based on what he feels is the appropriate one to give preference to. It's so fascinating how the halacha orchestrates even such types of details. Two students come to ask a question, who do you answer first? The question is not if you're going to answer both. You're going to answer everybody. But who do you answer first? Doesn't this tell us about the sensitivity of halacha, not only to the minutia of life, but to the minutia of communication, of how you communicate to a student? Halacha test the last halacha. Ein yeshein in the base hamedrash. No sloughing in the base medrash. There's no sleeping in the base medrash. V'cholam esnam in the base hamedrash. Somebody who dozes off. Chachmasei nasik kroyim kroyim. His wisdom is torn into shreds, which means he does not get the full picture. And we all know this to be quite practical, right? In the middle of a shir and you fall asleep and you missed the key connecting points. So you have a bunch of shreds, you have a bunch of torn rags, you don't have the full garment, you don't have the full picture. People think this is a curse, it's not a curse, it's a natural consequence. 
You slept through the main theme. Shlema said this in his wisdom. It's Chachma. Ukrayim Talbish Numa. The one who dozes off is dressed with rags, which means his Torah is fragmented. In the base Medrash, you don't converse only words of Torah. Even somebody who sneezes, don't say, Refua means to your health. Today we say, Gesundheit, Zugesund, Labriyut. In the, tar- these days they would say, Refua. The source of this comes from Pirke de Rebbe Lezer. Rebbe Kivege brings it in Brachas Dafnon on Gimel. In the beginning of the history, people would not get sick. But rather at some point in life, they would exhale or sneeze and their soul would go back to its maker. It was Yaakov Avinu who we find to be the first person who's sick in Chumash. Nobody was sick before Yaakov. Yaakov Inu asked Hashem, he said, I want to fall ill before I die so I could communicate with my, with my children and I can give them a tzava. And that's why today when somebody sneezes, we say it should be tzugazon, not chalila, the end of your physical journey. So he says, even this, saying refuah, which is not varim betelem, it's giving somebody a blessing, it's not appropriate to do it in the base medrash. Certainly other words should not be spoken in the base medrash. And the Rambam says, Kedushas base medrash, chamurim kedushas bateknesias. And the holiness of the base medrash is even greater than the holiness of bateknesias. Bas medrash was places where they, that were dedicated to learning, bateknesias were places dedicated to davening. He says the kedusha of the base medrash is greater than the kedusha of a base Beis So the Rambam tells us here there's no sleeping in the Beis Medrash and the results of it are negative. I should just say that in Shulchan Aruch Arachayim Kufnon Aleph he does say that you're allowed a Shinas Arai which means a little temporary nap. However, other Poiskim say even Shinas Arai which we see from the Rambam even dozing off even a nap is forbidden. However, in Hilchus Talmud Torah of the Shulchan Aruch Arav Perek Dalet he says that if somebody is learning day and night in Beis Medrash and forcing him to go to a home or another room to sleep outside of the Beis Medrash will cause bitl toida, this person is allowed to sleep in the Beis Medrash. What about Sugazunt? So the Shach writes in Yeridea Simen Reish Memvav, the Sif Sekai in Hilchas Talmatein, in the name of the Prisha, that in these days they would not lift up their eyes from the Svarim and therefore they should not say Tzugazunt. Certainly they would not have conversations. But now, people are not so careful. Anyway, they could say, However, the Taz says that one should not be lenient when it comes to this halacha. One has to be extremely careful about the nature of conversations that one has in the base Medrash. It's a place to speak divrei teira, words of Torah. One should, of course, be careful what they say anywhere. We discussed this in Hilchis Deis, but here the Rabbim is discussing the halachas in the base Medrash and Hilchis Talmud Torah.